it's kind of hard to see that small, but Best Buy and, and Samsung, or no, it's not office lines, but Samsung's online as well. Um, and so we do a JavaScript injection onto the page. So every time their page gets a request, we get a request and we decide what to put back on the page. So usually if you're hitting that reviews tab, you're seeing everything inside that reviews tab is controlled by us. We're completely white labels, so one of the things I like about having this having this uh, having this podium to speak is, and, and I probably should have done this question before I didn't think about it, I usually do, is how many of you heard this article as a It's not bad. That's a good one. Could you speak a little louder? I can. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you for the help. Yeah, so usually, if I get a single hand out of an audience that's heard of our voice, it's because I'm, in, I'm speaking in Austin, Texas, and I'm speaking to an audience at four. So, uh, since we're white label, since our system is completely customized, looks completely different on every site you're on, people don't generally recognize that, wow, there's one provider who's doing all of this. So it turns out that we do, I'm oh, sorry, jumping ahead, but we do that for 1,200 plus brands across the internet. I'll show you a few of those in a second. But it's a client side JavaScript injection, and we also serve all of the necessary JavaScript, CSS, images, everything. So everything inside that product we use tab is served by us. So the great thing is that we control all of that real estate. We work with the client to decide what goes there. We get to, we get to promote particular content that's going to be more relevant. We get to use different algorithms to, to source content out there. Um, and every time our clients get a product page hit, so or in this case, looking at this grill, every time somebody looks at that grill, we also get a page hit. So we're actually collecting a lot of information on the back side of the page views, how many unique users this client sees. So we can actually tie that together and we can analyze that and say, you know, here are your top rated high volume products, or here are your very low rated, but they get a lot of traffic products. And so we can give guidance to clients on what they should do. We can actually just present the information they can determine what to do with those. So as I mentioned, we're on over 1,200 brands, different websites. Uh, so a lot of names you recognize up there. There's a couple of names that I can say, but I can't put their logos up there, like Walmart, uh, Saks Fifth Avenue, I don't think is up there, Macy's, usually it is. But there's a lot, of, a lot of big brands. Basically all the biggest brands that you see on the internet are using our platform. So it's one system, or one series of systems, of course, that are in our data centers running the collective uh, bandwidth of 1,200 different sites. So we do a lot of scaling. I talked about, uh, you know, in the presentation abstract, that this is, you know, we're doing big MySQL. We're doing a lot of transactions. We're doing a lot of uh, reads. And we're doing large amounts of data in MySQL. It sounds like from the audience that a lot of people are in that same space. So some of this may be new to you. Some of this may be... You know, yeah, we're already doing that. Just a nice affirmation of, hey, we're doing the exact same thing. And, and so far, we haven't ruined the company in six years. It's still growing. It's still being great. But we do a ton of requests per second. That number and the, the number of terabytes per day um, is uh, is about six months old. And I couldn't couldn't get into the system today to get the new number. But I did pull the numbers from November. Now November for us is Black Friday, right? And so it's it's atypical of the rest of the year. But with our growth. Typically what happens is Black Friday is where we will be the next year at July. And then we'll jump another 40% up from that to the next year's Black Friday, and then we'll be there again. So this is about what we expect to be at next July. So we serve... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Do you know what this translates for the number of units? Number of unique users? Yeah. I can't go too far off of the presentation. I do. Um, and anybody who really, really wants to know, I can tell you a person, but okay. um, because we just recently filed an S1, oh. um, we have to stay fairly strict to the numbers that are in our S1, the numbers have to be uh, available here as well. So, and uh, unfortunately, the number of these is not something we can verify, so we can put it on S1. Uh, so I wasn't sure. Do you guys actually own the reviews? We do not own the reviews. The okay. client that we're working for owns the reviews, but we we get we, we host them for them. Right. So you said, yeah. Sorry. Store on your servers, right? Yeah, we store it on our servers. We do all the aggregation and analytics on our servers. If they want to leave, they get to take their data and it's completely there, so we don't get to use data again. They do sign agreements that allow us to share it and aggregate it in various forms. So we do get access to the data for their benefit, but we don't have any ownership over their data. We own a ton of data all along the site. So the data is basically the traffic for the read and write. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely a lot heavier read than it is right. Yes. So yeah. So what we're talking about here is, is definitely on the read side 
of the traffic, which is definitely the, the heavier side for us. So Black Friday and uh, on Cyber Monday, 1.5 million requests, uh, 8 million page views in November. So just a ton of stuff. So this is our stack. It's Java in the middle, using Spring to manage the POJOs. We're actually using Spring and VC to manage all of the, uh, the control layer. Uh, for the front end, it's all, uh, for the front end that, you, that the consumer sees, it's all jQuery and FreeMarker. FreeMarker is a templating language that takes XML or Java beans and turns it into uh, one of the HTML. Uh, in the back end, we use things like GWT, Google Web Toolkit, uh, Scrap Board, uh, which got a new name, I meant to change the slide. Um, Ember. Ember. Ember, thank you. It was Firewood, like, not Kindle. Yeah, Ember. Um, it's a great library. Actually, one of our developers contributed uh, a fair amount to that open source framework, and we really like it. Uh, we're building a lot more on it. And then we still have some stuff to build out on the industry. On the back end, uh, MySQL, pretty heavily. Solar and Lucene, uh, also quite heavily, with over 75 terabytes of data in Solar and Lucene. Product and you got reviews on that product, and there are star ratings, and that's about it. It is 
case, a four star and a five star for, for the iPod. That's pretty simple. Okay, if I want to get the average rating, this is not a big deal. I put the product on a pod, and I go get its reviews, and I just tell the database, give me back the average of that pod. Not a big deal. Now, it's not a big deal when it's one product and when it's two reviews. It's not a big deal when it's one product and it's 10,000 reviews, 60,000 reviews. But at points, this begins to break down. I'm now doing a lookup through 80 million products to find that one product, and I'm looking up through 100 million pieces of content to find the 10 or 20 or 50 that are on that product. And so I now have two very large lookups, and I have to join those results up together. So there's the query we would do. It's pretty straightforward. Everybody is well aware of that. So one of the things that we've had to do, and in a number of cases we've done this, is we duplicate ourselves. We pre-calculate values. We have entire tables just dedicated to, hey, we're going to need this, and I'm going to need it. It's, it's hard to calculate. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, most popular products or uh, top contributors, uh, the most helpful review is, is a really, we've got a really nice Bayesian algorithm uh, for calculating the most helpful reviews so that if you know, this has only been on the market and you know, only been visible for a couple of days, but it's receiving a lot of help listings. We'll try and promote it sooner and see, do people still think this is the most helpful review or do they like the other one? And so things like that, where that calculation can take a long time, you don't want to be doing that for every single hit a million times over per day or a billion times over, eight million times over per month. So we want to calculate that up front. So we'll cache that in the database. And so you'll do things like that, which are breaking the rules, you know, according to your database professor, but it's extremely helpful. Now, this is a key. Kind of dangerous as well. Now I've got stale data. A new review comes in, and my process for calculating that average rating can be off by you know, 15 minutes. And so I have to deal with the consistency there, right? I have to make sure that the process is smart enough to kick off uh, a inline recalculation of that. If this is the third review, and if it's the 300th review, it probably doesn't matter that I recalculate this in the next hour or 24 hours because the the average rating is not going to change that much. So you have to be smart about how you do it. The second thing, follow those things. Too much So there's your SQL compiler, right? You take your SQL and you send it into the database, and it basically compiles it. It translates it into the statements that the database understands, right? But it's going to have to do that every time at runtime. It can make some guesses, it can make some, some predictions, it can have some stuff cached and ready to go so that it can, it can do that effectively and efficiently. But fundamentally, it's going to be, depend upon your query, potentially the parameters you have to your query, the indexes available, and the statistics on the index that are available. So then it's responsible for how much is this query going to cost? Okay. How many indexes should I use? Which indexes should I use? And what order do I join these tables in? And it's absolutely your best friend. When it works right, when you're working at a small scale, this is great. This takes care of all that business for you, and you don't have to worry as much about it. But when it goes to the other side, and it chooses wrong, and you can't figure out why, or you can't coax it to go the right way, it can be your worst enemy. You can end up fighting against that query optimizer. So take this query, for example. All we're doing is giving the text of all the five-star reviews on the iPhone. So there's a couple different ways that Query Optimizer can look at this and say, this is the way I'm going to it. So one way is, hey, for every product named iPod, probably aren't too many of those. Uh, for each review on that, check and see if it's five stars. And if it is, then add it to my result set. I'll pull all the text off of them, and then I'll send them back. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Nice and easy. Uh, or you can say, hey, for every review that has five stars, check and see if it's on an iPod. And if it is, then add my results and pull the text off and send it back. Both are perfectly reasonable ways to approach this problem. And depending upon your data set, depends upon which one of these you would choose. So the query optimizer is great at that. But there are times when overall the schema looks like X and you should choose Y. So I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, because we are a multi tenant solution, we have 100 million pieces of content in our database. So that table is very, very large. The product table is considerably smaller, generally speaking. But some clients have 20 million, uh, 20 million products. 
right? Most of those products do not have a single review. So if you go and scan all the reviews to look for reviews for the product, you're doing a very large lookup to find that you have nothing instead of going down there. So there are times when the schema, or the, the schema, but the actual data can belie uh, the query optimizer and trick it into going the wrong way. So what do you do when a good query just goes around? It just, it just goes completely off the board. So obviously, you guys all know. You can explain that query. You can dig in, figure out which index is it using, how well is it using them, all of that good stuff. If, one thing that we've learned, um, and if you've not, if you're not solved on this yourself, this, this is a nice tip, uh, is you really want to look on the affected system. I know for DBAs, uh, they may say you're not allowed to see that affected system. For larger shops, sometimes that's just completely off limits. But when and if possible, um, getting closer and closer to that affected system is always your best bet. Because statistics play a large part in the query optimizer. And statistics don't always match between one copy of data and some other copy of data. Uh, there's a number of factors that can come into play. So, uh, your indexes. Like you could go and you add the appropriate index. Somebody wrote a query and it wasn't indexed, so it's really slow. Okay, that's, that's easy, right? You can check that, check the leading index, right? make sure that those indexes are structured in a way that they're, they're easily accessible and, and often used. And then you can start using hints. So now we're getting into a dangerous point, right? Now I'm saying to the query optimizer, you're stupid, you're smart, and I know better than you do how to run this query. So here's a hint. I want you to use this index. And that's generally okay. All I'm doing is saying, hey, here's a suggestion to the query optimizer. He can say, screw you, I'm going a different path. And he might. And he might be right, he might still be wrong. But he, he's only been hinted. You've been told him completely, no, you idiot. I am forcing you to go down this path. Now this works. If you are legitimately smarter about this query, you know the right way to get it optimized, you can force it to use a particular index. But what happens when your data changes? What happens when your schema changes? What happens when the way your data is laid out changes? You all of a sudden get 20 million more products, and the performance of your query goes up. Okay? Your application can't flex and bend with the dynamics of the data that's changing underneath it. So this is dangerous. Even more dangerous. I hate this one. We use it, we use it ever so sparingly. I actually, for a long time as a developer, I actually kept a running total of this. And I would go back and check it and see how much it was growing. And I would go back and I would see, like, is this one still true? It's a straight joint. How many familiar with the straight joint? Straight joint is a nasty one. It works when you need it to. It has forced this joint to be first table as the left table and the second table as the right table. So force it to load the left table first and then this one. So not just force it to the index, but force the join to happen in the order I say it has to happen. Again, this can make for extremely brittle code, but at times, when you're absolutely adamant, this report is running over a billion records, trust me, I don't want to scan all of those first, I want to start here, because I can narrow that down, you can do that with that, with that straight join. It comes in a lot when you've got uh, nested queries and things like that, where sometimes the statistics and the optimizer can't can get better as well. But like I said, it can be a really, it can be a really nasty one. So, we talked about this. Nobody's running one data this thing. It's a big data world, right? But I think a lot of times in, in classes it's taught, oh, here's a database. You only have one of them. You can put a whole lot of stuff in. And you can. You can put a lot of stuff in MySQL, MSQL, all those out all over those database servers. We'll take an absolute ton of data. Most of them don't really ever get grumpy and keep putting more data in. Yes. But the performance comes in. I now have 100 million records in this table, or, or a billion records in this table, and the table doesn't take one second to make that query anymore. It takes 10 seconds. Right? So to some extent, I can fix this. I can buy a bigger hardware. I can call up IBM, or I can call up Dell, or call up whoever, and I can buy a 3 gig record server with 12 cores, with 24 cores, with 48 cores. I can keep buying bigger and bigger machines, right? The problem is, is that, and a number of people observe this, and I don't think, I couldn't find any great, like, reference here where I could say it. Somebody really smart proved this is true, but historically, over the long run, thus far, data is 
vastly outpacing Moore's Law. Moore's Law is growing at an incredible rate. It is amazing to watch you know, these machines that we have today you know, be a million, a billion, you know, just crazy faster than the machines we had just a couple of years ago, let alone compared to you know, the machines we had when we were growing up. So the problem is, is that I can't keep up. I can't keep buying bigger and bigger hardware to keep up with bigger and bigger data. It's just not an option. I've got to start thinking about this in a bunch of different ways. And I still need quick results. So it's not like I can just get more lazy about this and say, yeah, that's it. I used to take 10 seconds, now it takes 30, now it takes an hour. That's not going to be acceptable for my business users. Right? That's not going to be acceptable to me, you know, for my applications. Thankfully, there are a ton of options. And you can mix and match these in really interesting ways. So we talked a little bit about sharding. We call it partitioning here. Kind of one and the same. They're a little bit different. There's some use and between the two. But fundamentally, you could say, I'm going to break up my data in a way that allows me to scale bigger. Okay? So I'm going to put my users in this database, and my products over here, and my reviews over here. And this works OK. If those things are orthogonal and you're not really bringing them back together, it works OK. The problem is in our business, reviews and products are intimately linked. So if I put those in two different databases, I'm in trouble. Because now I'm, well, I would never do, but I could do XA transactions. I'm not going to do a cross database. So I've got to do a call to this database serially, then make a call to that database, which is going to be slow. I'm going to have more latency. I'm going to have more problems. It could work. I could make it work. I'm not really a fan. So for us, we said, yeah, this doesn't really work for us yet. Now, as we've grown with that, we've added more applications. As we've added page view tracking and unique user tracking and logs, you know, a log database that we just loaded in all of our logs. Those are separate. Those don't need to be separate. We can keep those separate, and that helps too. Because now that database is focused just on logs, and that database is focused just on display traffic. And that's great. This one works really well for us, for us. For us also, if every client were multi -tech. every client's basically identical in terms of the data they store. So what we do is we make a bunch of copies of that, and then I say, well, client A, you're over here, client B, you're over here, client C, you're over here, and then I come back around. And that way, I'm spreading that load out across a bunch of identical databases. This works pretty well. But it only works to an extent. And it's also really nasty when you have to take K and move him over here and kind of change the, change the partition, right? If I have to move somebody from one section to another, that's a lot of data. A lot of times I have to move. So it gets kind of, it gets kind of like a deep in that regard, too. This is one we talked about. Uh, if you want to be mentioned, IO based partitioning, or just having a master and a bunch of slaves. Right? This works extremely well in SQL. I'm sure everybody's, or most everybody's taking advantage of this in SQL. If you're not, depending upon your data, and depending upon your application, this is a very beautiful thing. So for us, as somebody mentioned, we are extremely rehabbing. 99% rehabbing. 1%. Most people don't write reviews. They'll write reviews when they're solicited to. We, we ask you, you know, send you an email, ask you to write a review on something. They'll write a review. But generally speaking, people aren't just out there writing review after review after review all day. You're out there reading a review after review after review all day, trying to decide what to buy. And so for us, we broke the thing had our application smart enough to say, hey, for write traffic, route it over here to the master. And then we have all the replications set up such that we have hundreds or thousands of these. And these are all pretty lightweight, right? They're just saying, hey, what changes did you get, master? What changes did you get? And they're just kind of peppering him with a few questions every now and then. But other than that, these guys aren't too busy doing writes. They're handling all reads. So instead of just picking one of these strategies, so our boys picked actually a, a combination of these and some other stuff that I'll talk about in a second. So we actually did uh, clusters based on IO partition internally. And then we put a content distribution network in front of our entire data center. And we said, OK, content distribution network, if it's these URLs, it goes over here. If it's these URLs, it goes over here. So now you're doing something akin to horizontal partitioning there. Right? It's not done in our application, but it's done up in the content distribution network. But it still works functionally the same. So I have another one of these over there that's handling L through Z, or L through S, and maybe T through Z is something. Is, is done another. So I can keep multiple copies of this, 
They're all basically the same, and they're all handling the load, balancing the load. And internally, I can scale these slave databases and the application servers and horizontal and add more and more of those as I have more load. So you can kind of mix and match those, and you can find a really find the sweet spot based on your application. I know the dual masters thing is something that some people don't know. We didn't have the to go that route because we don't have that heavy of read term, I'm sorry, write term. Right? Even today, like we're still well within the capacity of one master database. It's not even that big of a machine in AWS that handles all the write term. I have a question. So we actually end up setting up a chain of them. Right? Uh, partially because you've got, we've got two different data centers. So we'll have a master that is the, the local master, and then there'll be a master with the backup data center that we'll be reading from that, and then others will chain off of that. And then we'll have the slaves that chain off of the master, and then other slaves that chain off of, of some of those slaves. So you kind of end up with this, this tree of slaves. So yeah. So when I know there's no particular side, you have a way to like, make sure they're always getting to the same slave database. So there is. There is absolutely a delay. The good news is for us that that delay is pretty short. It's only a couple of seconds between the master and the slave. It's usually, it's usually stayed. If it goes over two seconds, the alarms are going off. But the, between the master and like the last one in the chain. We tend to, well, so we tend to set those last one in the chain up as like a reporting instance or a, 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 a just anything that's kind of off that processing. We'll use the Anything that's, that's actually feeding live traffic typically gets a first generation slave. <laughs> the short answer is we, we don't, we haven't yet. Um, so, so we can, you can do things, you can take these offline, you can upgrade the storage on them so that you, you stay with a safe headroom. Um, we have moved clients. The one trick that we have done is, um, so we have moved clients. It's, it's rather painful for us. Um, it's, it's, you absolutely pointed out a flaw. We, we've got a data team back home working on it. The one trick that we've done to survive thus far is when a, system, when a particular cluster is getting too big, we'll split it. We'll make an exact copy of that exact state of data. And at that same time, we'll split the traffic. We'll repair any little bit of data that might be missing from the backup we use. Actually, I think we use hot backups. It's a bit of a loss to one of these. So now we have two exact copies. So we used to be cluster four, now we have two cluster four, cluster four, cluster four, five. Right? We're routing the traffic, but we've now split the traffic. We've now split. Half the traffic is going here, and the other half is going to the other one. And then what I'll do is I'll go in and I'll run the lead. And it still sucks. But now it's split. Each of them is roughly half the size. Each of them is now doing half the company. They continue to grow. Okay. It's not ideal. We really want to be able to seamlessly move people between. Um, it's just not. It's not easy. Yeah, the question. Does this mean you're starting is starting an application layer to see where the traffic goes? So a lot of it's done at that content distribution network, right? It's actually configuration of the content distribution network to say, hey, this URL belongs to that you are to that cluster, and that URL belongs to that cluster. So Walmart is on this cluster, and Best Buy is on that cluster. Home Depot is on that cluster. So you're saying you have multiple copies of your app that's configured to specific cluster databases. But because you're running SQL, how are you using the content distributors to know the URL? They are not <coughs> in the okay. your, You said that your content distribution look at the URL to know which cluster to go to. Right. Yes. Then does it mean you have multiple copies of your app running? Yes. Which to go yeah. No, I, I, I've, I've simplified things here, right? There's one application server drawn here, running on three databases. It's actually usually the other way around. It's usually three or four application servers running off of each of these. Okay. So that's a bunch of application servers. So yeah, we've got a ton, a ton of those, and then also a ton of read only databases as well. Or all your clusters created before? No. No, so, yeah. so recently, uh, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can play with it, right? So the question was, are all your, are all your clusters created equal? The follow-up question, are you using commodity hardware? Yes, we are using commodity hardware, that question. Um, and no, no, you don't have to treat all of your clusters equal. When we very first started out, and, and to some extent we still have this, this mindset, 
uh, we created the clusters with this sense of this one will be our high priority cluster. It will be our most secure cluster. It will be our uh, top tier client cluster. They're going to get an extra nine of availability. We're going to go through some extra steps in terms of monitoring, in terms of fault tolerance. It's going to cost us more to run, but it's going to be more reliable because we're going to put some extra steps in. Things, things are relatively simple to do, but do cost money that we don't do on some of the other clusters. Since then, we've had really good luck with just basic, you know, simple fault tolerance, hot backups for the databases, multiple application servers where you're not sticking to any one of them, we can take them out and put them back in. And so we've basically gone away from the top tier clients having their own cluster. By this point, the top tier clients were such high volume that they still have their own cluster. We never put anybody else on with them because Walmart and Best Buy just did absolutely no crap. Can you talk about how big your infrastructure is? How big your infrastructure Unfortunately, we have an operations team that handles a lot of that for us, so I can't speak in detail, but I can definitely put you in touch with folks who can talk more about the infrastructure side of what we've done. I've, I've been, in my opinion, thankfully, res, kind of reserved from having to get into that world too much. <laughs> I, I enjoy it. I, I wish I knew the exact number of servers that I could speak to it, but I, it, it's... But you know, it's hundreds of thousands. It is in hundreds. I don't think it's in thousands yet, uh, but it is in hundreds. So, this is a fun one. This, is, this, this one and five are actually new additions. We've kind of given this presentation back in Austin at UT before. Uh, I think I gave this once at Carnegie Mellon. We gave it at the University of Illinois. Uh, or Bob Champagne once. Four and five are new. We've been introducing new things to our staff. So, you know, RDBMSs, relational databases, are extremely powerful tools, but that adage goes that if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And RDMSs are a great hammer. And I don't want to knock them. They are great at driving things in and solving those problems. But the truth is, there are a lot of other useful tools out there that are kind of in the database or data store space. One of them is call more databases. So there's some great row-oriented databases. Oracle, MySQL, everybody's in love with. We love it. It works great for us. But there's also some amazing column oriented databases. I'm not working with any of these except for InfoBrain. But I did go out and do the research to find them. And they are well regarded and they're good tools, generally speaking. Uh, but InfoBrite's an interesting one. If you're familiar with working with MySQL, InfoBrite is the data storage engine for MySQL. It's, it's, written by, it's not written by the MySQL team, it's written by a, a different team uh, of people working on this project. And so it's a different data storage mechanism, much like there's MyISA and InterDB. Right? Everybody's familiar with the concept of MyISA and InterDB. Anybody not familiar with this? Is it open source or is it on my own? So, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. There was one person real quick. So, my iSTEM was the original data store for MySQL. It didn't support transactions. I think they've added it now. It's really blazingly fast. And then they added InnoDB, which added foreign key uh, references and transactions. And so, if you, if you need good handle foreign key kind of constraints and kind of transactions, then you use InnoDB. So, but that's, that's completely pluggable. So, you can, you can be working with MySQL, you can be using all the beauty of MySQL and plug a different data store in. So yes, it is actually, one version of it is open source. It's, it's kind of gone the new wave of open source technology where there's a, a free version, so the premium of open source, right? There's a free version of open source and then there's premium versions that have up features above and beyond that, and pay services and um, consulting and all that. So InfoBright, which is actually the name of it, I believe is the name of the data storage technique, is column oriented, but it still behaves like my So. Let's take a look real quick at an example, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. Okay. So here's these rows, here's this table, I've got all these things, and if I want to calculate the average rating for each product, we'll have to fetch all those rows. So I'm going to get block one of rows from the disk, and it's going to come back to those first two rows, and I can start calculating, and then I'm going to go and get block two, and I can just get fetches on that, I'm going to get block three, but I'm going to fetch all those rows. I'm going to have to fetch the text and the timestamp, and I mean, there's probably 20 or 30 other columns on that table by now, right? That I had to fetch that I didn't really need for my query. So if we stop and we say, well, wait a minute. Let's pivot that data. Let's think about it in terms of columns. If all I really need is the IDs and their ratings, and I can aggregate that, and if I can do that really fast, that's going to be useful. So a column-oriented database spins all of that. 
and it's point B, I can go and get just the IDs and their corresponding ratings and leave all the rest of that other stuff on disk. And the other thing that's really cool is that InfoBright cheats. It does some really, really slick stuff. I'm really impressed with, with the tool uh, in a lot of ways. They chunk data and they think about it in terms of chunks and blocks. Uh, I think it's the term I forget the exact word. But what they do is they will calculate statistics for those blocks. And looking at your, your various keys and your indexes you've asked for, uh, for that data, they will go ahead and pre-calculate a number of statistics. So when I call for the average rating for a particular product, it can give me that back lightning fast. One, because I have to go and get a whole lot less data from disk. And two, because, actually, two, because that data on disk was compressed, and we'll talk about that in a second. And three, because it already had calculated the sum of the column and the count of distinct values, the count of values in that column. And so it actually just looks at the metadata on that block, divides, and hands me back the number. It's, it's instantaneous. Where on a simple InterDB table, if anybody's familiar with just a simple count across a million or 10 million rows can take a few seconds, it's instantaneous. And if I'm right, because it knows the count of blocks. So it goes and fetches each block, says, what's your count, what's your count, sums them, and hands it back. It's really, really fast. What about for averages, for million rows? Even for averages, really, really it's really, really fast because it's already stored the sum. It's already pre-stored the sum and the count. So it stores it in component parts, but it can get it back together very quick. It's just a full So does this mean you actually store two copies of data, one in your VPN, one in? We're at two so far. Right. <laughs> yeah. We have, I mean, obviously we have lots of copies of the data, right? We have our master and all of all the, the slaves. So we have lots of copies there. But we do. We actually purposefully introduced this uh, InfoBright system and introduced a whole bunch more copies. Now, Truth be told, when you start a data like this, and all of a sudden I ask for, give me the review on product one, I now have to fetch all five of those blocks. So this is not a perfect solution. It's not a perfect solution by far. Okay? So they've got some really, really neat, neat benefits. They've got a lot lower I.O. because you're only fetching what you absolutely need if your queries are structured for this. So I'm throwing the data in two places, and so your application needs to know that when you're trying to retrieve, you feel like, okay, I'm getting the average, so I need to go to the yeah. store. Yeah. Yeah. So th his question was, so you store two copies of the data, one columnar and one row, and so you have to kind of choose which data store you're going to go to, and the application has to have that logic. Yes, absolutely. In reality, for most things on the display side, I'm going to get one page of data, I'm going to get some aggregates, some, some review averages or whatever, that I probably already have. I don't want to calculate the average rating of the, the Nintendo Wii 100 million times over the Christmas period. Okay. I'm going to calculate it once. It's not going to change that much. I'm going to calculate it on manual just to make sure it stays fresh. So I cache. That was back in rule one, right? So realistically, what we did was we, we built our system to say, uh, basically, uh, um, it's called uh, Brainiac is the name of the system that we built. And basically, it's smart enough that when you, when you send the query in, it analyzes the query, analyzes the context of the query, and you give it a couple of hints, and basically it will route it to one of three places. I've talked about two so far, we'll talk about the third in just a second. So yeah, so you have lower I.O. for the reasons we talked about. You have compression. I actually get really, really good compression. One, because it knows the data type it's going to be compressed. And two, because all those data types are basically the same value. So we found incredible compression. So even though we picked up another copy of the data, as you put it out, it didn't cost us as much on disk to store it this way, which was really, really cool. Um, and something we didn't completely trust when we adopted it. Uh, so that was, that was a nice point. Now, the, the gotchas I talked about, the, the data manipulation is rough. Actually, in the free version of Everbright, uh, in the paid version, it, it's dual. In the free version, it doesn't even support creating, <coughs> update, or delete. Absolutely no those, those, those queries do not exist um, in, the sequel, in the sequel of the past. In the paid version, they do, but they come with some pretty significant drawbacks. The more you insert, the more references it starts pointing to, oh, hey, there's more over here, hey, there's more over here. And so it ends up getting, getting rid of some of your I.O. benefits, your compression goes down, um, your updates do the same thing, and you kind of end up with linked lists, basically, of, hey, there's an update over there, an update over there, and it just kind of drags it out, slows everything down. So generally, if you're doing that, the, the 
recommended practice I've seen thus far is to refresh it on a regular basis. In our case, since we were running, actually still are running on the free version, what we do is we keep two copies of the program. This may be where your question was, but I'll get to you in one second. We keep two copies of the program running all the time, and we are constantly ETLing the latest and greatest data. Into it. So one of them is the new hotness, and the other is old and busted, and we're tearing down and building it, building up a replacement. And then we put it back, and we put it back. We've actually found, um, we just recently came up with a way, and I can, offline I can give you more details, but I'll stumble through it, a way to actually build them even faster incrementally um, off of the other input right database, which was actually really, really something that was really across the form of to came up with that idea. So, um, yeah, so that's that's kind of what we do today. Did I cover your question? I was just curious how slow it was slow in this case. I mean, you're basically sacrificing one, the three versus one, right? You're basically, the number of things which are going to be much faster, you're sacrificing the amount of time you need to write something. Well, so yeah, you're going to have to sacrifice on the right because you're going to have to write across a lot of blocks. But then it also it also messes up the storage, right? Because you're having to you're scattering them out as opposed to letting it aggregate those blocks, like I was talking about. The block calculations get more complicated. So it, it slows things down. Yeah, I can't speak to specifics. We've always done three. First of all, we just done the swap and ETL. We only use this for reporting, primarily. All of our display stuff is generally run on this. The last rule, it's not you, it's me. RDMSs are a powerful, powerful tool. They're great for asset compliance, they're great for transaction management. But when you start having lots of them, when you start having what's called eventual consistency, it can get really tricky. RDMSs, databases in general, weren't built for eventual consistency. So in my, in, in my experience, this is, this is limited, in my experience, trying to force eventual consistency onto my SQL is tricky. You're constantly checking up, did this get there yet? Okay, now I need this to get there. Okay, are we in a good state? So eventual consistency relies on something called cap theory. Has everybody heard of cap theorem? 25, 50%. Um, cap theorem is consistency availability and partitioning, uh, partition tolerance. Uh, you get to pick two. You don't get all three. It's actually been proven you can't pick all three. So you get to pick two. So, okay, I'm picking consistency and availability. So I'm going to build one big data center, everything's going to be nice and close, and it's all nice and consistent because I'm going to write one transaction that's always available, but I can't divide this thing in any way. Any one part of it goes down, the whole thing goes down. And I have not that. Generally speaking, within a, a system, I'm going, to, I'm going to lose it. Or I could say, okay, I'm going to pick availability and partition tolerance. That's fine. I'm going to have multiple locations. It's going to be available there eventually. And if the network severs in between and one of them goes off the face of the earth, it's not a big deal. It'll take a while for me to get things back consistent, but it's okay. It's going to be fine. So you can pick two, but one of them is going to sacrifice based on the two that you pick. You're going to have to sacrifice one. So that's the concept of eventual, of eventual consistency. So for us to deal with this, we stumbled into the world of eventual consistency. We were, myself and another developer, were at a conference as a server-side job symposium in Las Vegas several years ago, and eBay was speaking uh, about eventual consistency, and it scared me. It scared me. I'm like, you're handling all this money, you're taking all these transactions, you're doing all, and you're you're dealing in eventual consistency. Like, oh yeah, this is a this is a record. And this person wants to buy it, and and, and they just would throw it out there and just like float around in the web, and all of a sudden it would poop and show up, and this piece would come out here. Eventually, it would be consistent with what was, and I'm like, this feels like the lazy thing in the world, but they deal, deal with extremely high scale, extremely low latency. And so, my, the other dog that I walked in, like, that is really impressive that that works, for one thing, but two, like, we need to think about this. And so then we started looking at our application, and in a lot of ways, we already stumbled into a visual consistency, but we were forcing it, we were shoehorning it into my sequel. So we started playing with it. Generally speaking, no SQL solutions are built around eventual consistency from the get-go. Um, no SQL solutions, for those who are familiar, are not only SQL, right? It's Solar, it's, uh, Solar's not general, it's uh, Mongo, um, HBase, Cassandra, a number of others. Um, they're non-relational, typically. They're built from, for distribution from the get-go. And so we looked at it and we said, wow, that would be really handy. And so we actually, uh, there are a number of choices out there to do those SQL. We actually chose Solar. We actually had already been using Solar for free text search. Um, inadvertently, and this is where we kind of stumbled into 
we inadvertently were using solar as a NoSQL solution. So I actually spoke at South by Southwest uh, last year on, on how we were using solar as a NoSQL solution um, at, you know, our scale. And uh, Grant Ingersoll from Lucid Imagination, the company that maintains solar, and, Lucid, and I spoke at South by about that. It's really interesting to see what you could do with Lucid and solar. I actually don't know whether I fully recommend using solar. I think there are some other great tools out there. But the, the key for us was we needed that free text search and we kind of stumbled into using it as a NoSQL solution. And, and this slide actually, I have to give credit, was from Grant. This was, uh, Grant had actually learned this at a different conference, but basically kind of had seen this breakdown of NoSQL solutions. So those are great tools for, for getting eventual consistency. And eventual consistency is a great way to, to find yourself scaling. You can, you can let things be written and eventually find a way to get them back consistent. Um, what are you using this database for? So for us, for us, remember we had all of those slaves. What we ended up doing is we ended up having all those slaves. We also had similarly, uh, Solar supports uh, master slave setup. So we would have a, a Solar master and a bunch of Solar slaves. So that if you were just just loading data, we just go to MySQL. If you were searching, if you had a text search, or you were filtering, or you were faceting, we'd go to Solar because those those were things that Solar was really good at. Um, what we found was that we could actually just go to Solar and basically turn MySQL into a key value store. We would go to Solar and we'd say, Solar, what should I show to this person? Given this circumstances, give me the statistics, give me the overall picture, the rating average, and all that good stuff, <coughs> so, that I can, so that I can put that up here on page. Oh, and by the way, what are the five reviews I go to this one? And I go to MySQL and I'd say, review one, two, three, four. And so we inadvertently had had layered solar as a MySQL solution and turned MySQL into a key value store. And so there's a conversation going on in the office back in Austin uh, over the last few weeks of should we just turn off those MySQL instances, push all the data into, into the scene, and just fetch it all up? I don't know if that's the right answer, but it's an interesting question. Thank you. Well, it also has to do with the case of Good question. So you get to pick today and you still choose solar, and if not, why not? And question number two, did you mention Elasticsearch before? I did. I did. And I'll, I'll have to talk more about that too. Um, so, if we have to pick it again, I really like Solar as a search engine. I think it's spectacular. As a NoSQL solution, I don't think we would have done that. I don't know if any of the other NoSQL solutions have as strong a search side as I would need. Uh, my experience and my investigation says maybe not. But I haven't explored them. For your use case, which one do you think is? For our use case, solar was a great thing. It's an absolute It's a memory hall, not your lie, but it is a great thing. Uh, and then Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch was introduced by our labs team as an experiment. They were using prototyping. We like it because it scales really well. It's got the, the kind of cloud mentality built into it that solar doesn't have yet until solar cloud comes out later this year. Um, so that is really nice. Production? We use it in our production version of our labs applications. I don't think it's in any of our production like high scale up. So we're also considering using solar as a self assessment player, but one of the issues with solar is the right speed that you have, where any time you need to update the index, that's the key issue with solar. Yeah, right? the, present, the presentation I gave at South by gives some clues as to how we manage the, the how, like schema changes and the full rewrites. Right, so you do, always do, do you do indexing, uh, do you do periodic re-indexing, or do you do real-time indexing? Any time something changes, get pushed to solar, or is this? So historically, we've done periodic re-indexing about every 10 weeks, and that's when the schema changes would go up, and we would push all new indexes up at that time. We actually just re-implemented that over the last couple of weeks, and it's basically we can do it every two weeks now. So, but what about data changes? So data, data, change, change. data changes are flowing through in our system every 15 minutes. Every 15 schema minutes. changes we can do every two weeks. Okay. So the, basically, your solar index is behind 15 minutes of the SQL database. Yes. Right, so you are handling all the queries using Solar and using MySQL only for uh, primary keyword. Yep. Yep. So, in addition to wrapping up, because I know there are a bunch of questions, but also we are getting a little close on time. Uh, so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the answer to how do you scale big on MySQL. And the answer is there's not really one, right? There is no silver bullet. I don't think anybody was expecting there to be this amazing silver bullet. I'm like, oh, of course, I never thought of that. It's, it's a mix 
of the right technologies. And I know that's kind of a cop-out answer, but there's a lot of great things you could use, things that are presented here, and other things that I haven't thought of, or others haven't thought of yet, that you can use to, to make sure that it scales. Um, you know, being open to using more than one. So, you know, databases are still a very, very important part of our application and basically every application built. Data stores, databases, really. But, you should know what's going on underneath the hood, and fundamentally, you have to decide what trends are. Is a row-based system correct for you? Do you do lots of aggregation? No, maybe not. Maybe it's a cloud-based system. Is a NoSQL data store better? Are you doing search? Maybe not, right? You kind of have to kind of have to know what's going on inside the system to choose the right. My marketing manager back in Austin put this slide in. This is us back in Austin, and it's the shameless plug, which is the last slide. Any other questions? The company back in Austin is 500 people in office, six years old. Um, there are 200 workers on Monterey and on. But Before we move on to the QA, I just want to give a big round of applause and thank you to our.
but I haven't used them in a couple of years, so I'm, I'm rusty on names or uh, 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 good ones. So, and I, I feel like every time I've kind of like started to approach that or like a Cassandra sort of solution, I sort of always just come back to like some denormalized, heavily indexed MySQL tables. So, having I mean, have you seen like, for, for instance, like that case you were showing that there was a significant difference from just like having like super denormalized, really crazily indexed you know, duplication yeah. in so, something like MySQL. In MySQL, yeah. especially like with RDS, when you can just like fire these things off, create them, throw it away. Yeah. Um, so I know that we were doing a large amount of denormalization prior to introducing uh, the FRI databases. Right. Um, and since then, we've been able to, to keep the data store clean and let the BI databases handle the heavy lifting. So our developers don't have to think, how do I need to splinter this out so they can handle a million records, a billion records over time. They think, how should I structure this that's correct and that's going to work well for my application? And when we need to do reporting on it, the great news is it's over here. So we kind of we kind of segmented purposefully because we have two different halves of the world, right? We have the display world, which is, hey, I gotta scan across a million reviews, but I'm gonna pick five fetching the same. And generally speaking, it's gonna be pretty intelligent as to which one I'm gonna get. Or in this case, I actually typically outsource that to solar. Hey solar, which ones do I get? Okay, great those five, send them. Or the other half of the world is that reported half. Right now I'm over here in the BI world, and I'm going across all of those, but I'm aggregating them. Them all up together. So, so it's a really, process really nice well business logic. Same. It really fits well with that particular business yeah. Right. Okay. yeah. So those would be the two benefits I would see is one, you can keep your data sort of the way you'd like to have it, nice and somewhat normalized, not ultra normalized. Um, and then secondly, you can fit it in a fit to it. Very nice what you said, use what fits. Absolutely. Um, so I've been up your solar or set so you have like shards of oh, solar and if you need to add a new shard like the process of doing that, is that painful? Um, I don't think it's extremely really painful to add a new shard, but we built a layer on top of that that manages the cores of the solar. If you're familiar with cores. So solar has the concept of cores, which are basically little bitty set, set, uh, sub-indexes basically. They're all set. Um, and so what we built was the uh, system that would manage, okay, well this system has the core. Actually, it's in that software. It's either in my software presentation or a presentation I gave with this contribution. I'll send you a link to it. Basically, we, we basically warm the core ahead of time by having it be a duplicate of one of mine for some period of time until we're confident that it's good. And then we will switch. So it'll, it'll, there'll be two of them live, one on this system, one on this system. And eventually we'll shut this one down and make this one the new master. So there's kind of some interesting logic was all in our application stack to manage all of those. Um, I think some of that was coming in some of the newer versions of solar. Power, so don't build the trust. Source your query optimizer up to up to solar. Actually, we have completely done that. 
At one point in time, it was literally, there was, there was a little bit of short in the code. And it was like, eh, for these, still use MySQL, and for these, use Solar to look up what routes to show. And one day we were like, you know what, this is silly. This thing is working great. Just cut this and have Solar to solve every single time. Which 5, 10, 20 of you to display to you, as well as calculating all the statistics. So it actually, it's really great at calculating like average ratings and stuff like that, which you can use fascinating. So this was an interesting question. I had a great discussion after the last uh, database event that I was at about uh, mixing. Uh, I, I have never tried mixing. Um, so everything we run is an MVP. The master, obviously, is an MVP. Um, so for the foreign key constraints and for the uh, uh, transaction support, obviously. Um, I wonder if, and I, I could be, I'm, I'm purely speculating here, if because we're using hybrid and because we're using the same objects to write as to read, maybe the foreign keys need to be there for us. I'm not sure. We've always kept in a across both sides, uh, both our master and our slaves. And, and it's an interesting question, something I passed back to our data team.com with, hey, why have we not ever switched our read our, our read only slaves to my eyes and go through Yeah, and it makes tons of sense. I just, for some reason, I, I don't know why we never tried it, or if we did try it, I don't, I never saw those results from that experiment. So, yeah, we're running entity the whole time. Cool. Last question, evening. Yes. So I'm wondering, like, what does the, uh, when you have so many data, what does the uh, process look like to transfer the data to So mostly we're relying on solar, or sorry, MySQL replication. Well, MySQL is solar replication. So we get the MySQL master right and the solar master right, and then we rely on that replication. We generally run some sanity checks between those two to make sure one, your, your point of, hey, the replication is 10 seconds behind, a minute behind, two minutes behind. At times we'll just, we don't, we don't we're automatically read something offline, but we start waking people up, right? Um, and then two, we run checks, both between the master and the slaves, to make sure that, yeah, that's all still good. Because, and, and I don't know if everybody's aware of this, there are a lot of things in MySQL replication, a lot of queries you can throw out in MySQL that don't replicate. You can mess up your IDs, your ID orders, you can mess up a number of different things. Um, and so we'll run some queries just to make sure that the data is staying consistent between the masters and the slaves, um, as well as uh, do some checks to make sure that the solar but yeah, for the most part, for all of our data transfer, it's, it's those guys. Except for to, over to the info price system, where we run a custom ETL. Uh, we did that in Groovy, um, and it's just kind of a, a fairly easy, extensible ETL that we just run, it generates an ETL, and then moves it across. It's actually fairly straightforward. Cool. That was great. Marcy Johnson from Bizarre Voice, thank you for coming. <laughs>